Welcome back to Designing New Algorithms with Qiskit, where we're diving into how researchers and developers can use the latest software tools to explore quantum algorithms that reach beyond the capabilities of exact classical methods. Let's kick things off with sample-based quantum diagonalization, or SQD, which is a technique to find eigenvalues and eigenvectors of quantum Hamiltonians and is being used across domains like chemistry and physics to solve problems at non-trivial scales. In this video, I'll introduce you to the key ideas behind SQD, and then Bryce Fuller will walk us through a coding demonstration of how to use this technique, which is available as a Qiskit add-on, to approximate the ground state energy of the nitrogen molecule on real hardware. From batteries to drug discovery, many of today's toughest questions hinge on one thing, modeling the lowest energy states of highly entangled quantum matter. For example, we may want to find the stable configuration of a molecule from its ground state energy, quantify the reactivity of a chemical based on the energy gap between two of its electronic states, or understand the magnetic properties of a material. Quantum computing has held the promise of speeding up these calculations. On one hand, there are fault-tolerant algorithms like phase estimation, which have potential for advantage over classical methods. These algorithms require circuits that are far too deep for pre-fault-tolerant devices. On the other hand, the VQE algorithm has been a cornerstone of pre-fault-tolerant applications of quantum computers in the last decade. However, VQE by itself cannot scale to realistic use cases, due in part to the large number of cost function evaluations we need to make with the quantum computer. This is especially true for Hamiltonians like those in chemistry, which can have many terms. It's become pretty clear that we need new techniques that can help us solve bigger problems with today's devices. This is where sample-based quantum diagonalization comes in. SQD gives us an approximation of the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of a quantum operator, such as the Hamiltonian of a quantum system. These systems could be a molecule or a lattice model describing a material, among many other things. What's more, SQD can be run on current quantum computers and has already been shown to scale to problem sizes beyond what was possible with VQE and even beyond the reach of exact classical diagonalization methods. This makes it an exciting new algorithm for applications like chemistry and physics. So how does SQD work? Using SQD in practice to approximate eigenvalues and eigenvectors of a Hamiltonian involves three main steps. The first is to prepare a circuit on a quantum device. We want the target wave function, for example, the ground state we're trying to approximate, to have significant support on the basis states generated by the circuit. The second step is to draw noisy samples from that circuit. And the third step is to use SQD to classically process those noisy samples to estimate eigenvalues and eigenvectors of our Hamiltonian. For example, this could be the ground state energy and wave function of a molecule, like we'll see later in this video. Let's zoom in on what's happening in that classical post-processing. This is an iterative procedure, and each iteration has four steps. First, a configuration recovery step flips the bits in some noisy samples using information about the input problem. Second, the samples can be divided up into a set of smaller batches for easier processing. Third, the Hamiltonian is projected and diagonalized in the subspaces spanned by each batch of samples. Finally, we collect the batch with the lowest eigenvalue, or energy, and we feed its information on into the next iteration of SQD. These four steps are repeated self-consistently for some number of iterations, and the result is an approximated lowest eigenvalue, or energy, and lowest energy eigenstate of our Hamiltonian. In other words, we're using a quantum computer to provide noisy samples from a few large quantum circuits, and then using a classical computer to extract as much meaningful signal as we can out of those noisy samples. But how do we apply SQD in practice? And what circuits do we use? Ideally, we wanna prepare time evolution circuits to study the spectrum or eigenvalues and eigenvectors of our Hamiltonian. 
But it's often infeasible to repair these circuits on today's quantum computers for Hamiltonians that have a very large number of terms. This is often the case for chemistry Hamiltonians that can have millions of terms or more for the practical systems we care about. Instead, for chemistry, which is the focus of this episode, what we can do is prepare a variational circuit onslaughts. Even for such Hamiltonians with a very large number of terms, it can still be possible to repair these types of circuits efficiently on a quantum computer, meaning with manageable circuit depths. One example is the LUCJ onsots, which stands for Local Unitary Cluster JASTRO. We'll use this circuit later on in this video when we estimate the ground state of the nitrogen molecule. However, we can't guarantee we'll converge to the ground state in this approach because we have to rely on the goodness of that variational circuit. But what if we're studying Hamiltonians with much fewer terms? For these Hamiltonians, it can be possible to prepare time evolution circuits on today's devices. This approach is better suited for physics Hamiltonians, such as those describing lattice models. For these systems, we prepare multiple time evolution circuits over increasing time intervals, which you may know is representing the Krylov basis. With these circuits and under suitable assumptions, we can prove that SQD will efficiently converge the ground state. In the next episode, we'll dive into the details of this approach and see how it works on an example physics Hamiltonian. Although the upstream circuits are different in these two approaches, the classical post-processing that we do with SQD on the samples remains the same. And both approaches can be used on problem sizes that are beyond what's possible to do with VQE or with exact classical diagonalization methods today. In fact, SQD has been demonstrated on chemistry problems using circuits with as many as 77 qubits and 3600 2 qubit gates, as well as on lattice models with 85 qubits and over 6000 2 qubit gates. If all this seems like a lot, don't worry. I'm gonna hand off to Bryce now to walk through this step-by-step -step in a code example so that you can see exactly how this works in practice. Thanks, Jen. Let's walk through a hands-on demo of how to model the electronic structure of the nitrogen molecule. We'll draw samples from a 36 qubit quantum circuit and we'll process them with the SQD Kiskit add-on. This will give us an approximation of its ground state energy at equilibrium. To do this, we'll follow the steps of a Kiskit pattern. In step one, we'll map the description of the nitrogen molecule to a quantum circuit. Here, we'll use the LUCJ circuit that Jen mentioned earlier. In step two, we'll transpile that circuit to run on a specific quantum processor. In step three, we'll execute that circuit with a sampler primitive to get noisy bit strings. And in step four, we'll use the SQD Kiskit add-on to post-process those noisy samples and estimate the ground state energy of the nitrogen molecule. So let's get into it. Okay. In step one, we want to take the description of our nitrogen molecule and map this to a quantum circuit. I have a script here which is going to help us do this. It's writing down the description of our nitrogen molecule, passing this to some packages that are specialized for chemistry calculations, and preparing an onsatz that'll be helpful to actually instantiate the circuit. After running this, we're ready to pass this into Kiskit functions and get a quantum circuit out. You can see we're using this package called FFSIM, which is specialized for working with fermionic circuits. Once we instantiate our circuit, it looks something like this. It has 36 qubits, which is a bit beyond what classical methods can exactly diagonalize. The next step, we want to take this circuit and transpile it so that it can run on an actual quantum processor. To do this, I'm going to specify what backend I want to use. In this case, IBM Pittsburgh. Normally, what a transpiler is doing is it's taking the circuit that you specified and figuring out which qubits on the processor you're going to be running on. It'll also do things like take the elements of your circuit and convert them into the gate set of the specific device. In this case, we're adding in an additional transpiler pass that comes from FFSIM and is specially tailored for this problem. You can see that without using this specialized transpiler pass, we end up with 1,402 two qubit gates. And after we add in the specialized pass, we roughly have that down to around 740 two qubit gates. So this specialized pass is really giving us a lot of savings in terms of the resources we need to spend on the quantum processor. The optimized circuit we get out looks something like this. You can see that the type of gates in here are different from before because it's been converted into the instruction set architecture of the processor. Next, 
we want to take this transpiled circuit and actually execute it on the quantum computer. We can do this really easily using the sampler primitives from Qiskit IBM Runtime. We'll define the sampler, pass in what backend we plan to use, the circuit we just transpiled, and in this case, we're going to take 100,000 shots. I already ran this job, so the results are back on my laptop already. And finally, in step four, we're going to take the noisy output from the quantum computer we just obtained, and we're going to post-process it using the SQD add-on. There's a lot happening in this code cell, so let's take it one bit at a time. First, we're just going to unpack the results object that we get from Qiskit Runtime. Next, we're going to define a solver that's going to be called inside the inner loop of our SQD function. So every time we want to take a subset of bit strings, project and diagonalize, like Jen mentioned, this is the solver that's going to do that. Also, it'll be helpful to visualize how well our function was converging as we continue to run for more iterations. So we'll specify this callback, which is basically just going to be saving data along the way so we can visualize what's going on. And finally, all of the hard work is happening inside of this function, diagonalize fermionic Hamiltonian, which comes from the SQD Qiskit add-on. There's a lot of parameters to this function, but they break up into three groups. There's some inputs which specify parameters of our actual system. So these are things like, you know, how many particles are in this molecule? What are the one and two body electronic integrals? Things like this. Next, we have some parameters that we're giving to SQD to tell it how we want this outer loop of the optimization to run. These are things like the maximum number of iterations we'll let it run for, and how converged it should be before it decides that it doesn't need to run any longer. And finally, there's some parameters that are just for the inner loop of the optimization. This is the Eigen solver. These are things like how many different batches of diagonalization it should do with every iteration, and how many bit strings it should sample for each one of those batches. Because we saved all of the results for the intermediate calculations using this callback function, we can visualize how well our energy was decreasing over time. We can see that after every iteration, our energy error is decreasing steadily. And after 12 iterations, we get below chemical accuracy. If we continue to let this run for longer, or we optimize the parameters further, we'll get even lower energies. And that's all there is to it. And that brings us to the end of this episode. We've included several links in the description below, so you can access the full version of the code example shown here, dive into the research behind the SQD technique, and learn more about Qiskit add-ons. And this is just the beginning. Be sure to like and subscribe to the channel so you won't miss the next video in the series, where we'll see how to apply SQD to a physics problem. Cheers!